With protocol already being established, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is truly a pleasure to join you at this economic forum hosted by the Chamber of Commerce. I want to first thank the President, Mr. Nelson Dilbert, and the Executive Director, Mr. Will Penu, for inviting me to speak. And I appreciate this opportunity to share my thoughts on the pivotal role our tourism industry plays in creating a sustainable economy in the Cayman Islands. Our tourism sector is a powerful catalyst for growth and development. It is an industry that not only carries a huge responsibility, but it has the potential to profoundly impact and shape our island's future for decades to come. Tourism is also incredibly dynamic. It generates revenue, provides employment opportunities for our people, and it is sometimes described as the industry of memories and dreams. Why? Because as human beings, we crave new experiences, and the wonder and excitement of travel adds so much to the rhythm and richness of our lives. Sustainability, on the other hand, particularly in the context of tourism, is a concept that encompasses the complete tourism experience. It incorporates the principles of balance, adaptation, and responsible travel. And the desire to be a source of positive benefit rather than a negative impact. The World Tourism Organization defines sustainability and sustainable tourism as tourism that takes full account of its current and future economic, social, and environmental impacts while addressing the needs of visitors, the industry, the environment, and its host communities. This is a mammoth task and it requires us to find a delicate balance between short-term gains and long-term sustainability. The government's aspirations for our tourism industry aligns with the WTO's perspective as it relates to those four pillars of sustainability, economic, social, human, and environmental. Our vision for tourism particularly over the next decade, is for it to be function, functional as a powerful engine for improving socioeconomic prospects of our people. And therefore, it must stimulate widespread economic activity. It must also foster new growth across our communities, create jobs and offer career opportunities for everyone, and showcase our unique culture and heritage while preserving our priceless natural environment and assets. And hot off the press, I am happy to note that the beauty of our island's natural environment has led the Cayman Islands to be recognized as the number eight in the world in the best of the best TripAdvisor's Travel Choice Awards. And to put that in context, fewer than 1% of the TripAdvisor's 8 million listings are awarded the best of the best award, which is a wonderful accolade for these beautiful islands. <laughs> for tourism to truly function as a catalyst for economic activity and growth, we must develop clear targets for our tourism industry and take a scientific approach to economic benefit and projections. We need to align our revenue goals with the necessary infrastructure investments to support them effectively. By doing so, we can optimize the economic benefits of tourism while maintaining a sustainable and resilient industry. We must also continue to be empowered to empower our local entrepreneurs and enable them to participate in the tourism industry not only as employees, but also as owners of businesses like the many people here in this room. Inclusivity, 
and the involvement of Caymanians in the industry remains this government's commitment. And the government continues to put in frameworks in place to boost their success. Now, let us paint the picture of what the future of tourism in the Cayman Islands could look like. So I want you to fast forward in time with me, say a, a decade from now, and just imagine. Imagine an industry where stayover and cruise visitors seamlessly coexist, enjoying an integrated and balanced experience where cruise passengers no longer compete with local life and downtown traffic and congestion are a thing of the past. I want you to imagine with me an industry that is decentralized with mom and pop shops flourishing all across the island, especially in the eastern and western districts, enabling the benefit of tourism to be spread more broadly and more equitably. Think about a diverse tourism product, offering a wide range of new experiences, highlighting Caymanian foods, crafts, tours, and attractions, authentically showcasing the culture of our islands. There would be an increase in Caymanian participation in the industry, with financial benefits positively changing the lives and providing more meaningful careers and professional development opportunities. Also imagine a robust infrastructure, such as interconnected roads network, networks, devoid of traffic, airports that support new routes and long haul service to our islands, and ports that run efficiently and effectively to support sustainable growth. Now all of that sounds too good to be true, but I believe that every one of those aspirations is achievable. So the question is, how will we get there? What is the plan and where are we now with respect to that vision? The first priority for our tourism industry is to return our visitation to the 2019 levels. Now I must say that this may be scary for some of you in the room, but it shouldn't be. And I'll explain to you why shortly. First off, the reason why we have to get back to the 2019 numbers is because it is critical for the underpinning of economic sustainability, increasing revenue generation from taxes and fees, boosting the availability of jobs for Caymanians and business opportunities for Caymanian entrepreneurs and business owners. And I'm happy to report that our efforts to reinstate stayover, stayover visitation are proving very successful, and I think many of you see that with the many guests on our islands. Between January and December of 2023, we welcomed 429,284 visitors. Now that's an impressive 85% of the 2019 record-breaking numbers, meaning the highest in our country's history. And this signals a strong rebound and sets a positive tone for our business community. Our hoteliers and the reps of the accommodation sector can confirm that the average daily rate is high, having increased well over 30% in 2023 compared to the year prior. And we have overperformed with respect to the collection of our tourism taxes. In 2023, we expected to collect $25 million, and I'm super excited to say that we did significantly better than that. Between January and December of last year, revenue collected from tourism accommodation taxes and fees amounted to 46 million and a half. Not only did it exceed our 2023 targets by $20 million, it also exceeded the 36.5 million collected from our record-breaking arrivals in 2019 by $10 million. Making 2023 the highest year on record. Now, let me repeat that again for those in the back that <laughs> might have not heard me. This is a record-breaking year, the highest year on record collected from tourism accommodation tax. Now, what this tells us 
is that even though the numbers have not yet fully recovered, we are earning more from our stayover visitors than ever before. And that is a true example of quality over quantity. For 2024, I've set a conservative target of 478,000 visitors, which is 11% increase over last year, and 95% of the 2019 stayover arrivals. The revenue target is 40 million for 2024 and 44 million for 2025. It is important to note, though, that returning to 2019 numbers is a benchmark. It is not the ceiling. Continued growth in visitor arrivals beyond 2019 will continue to occur incrementally in a managed way, driven by increases in room stock and airlift. And both are expected to increase this year through notable projects like the new Hotel Indigo just next door, along with growth in home sharing sites like Airbnb. Increased air arrival seat capacity from big international brands like Delta, which will be adding service from Minneapolis, St. Paul, and American, which will add the addition of Charlotte, North Carolina. Both will also impact the stayover arrivals. And I'm also pleased to say that we are looking at introducing new Cayman Airways routes in the Midwest in the winter season of this year. While I have full confidence that we will get back to the 2019 numbers for stayover, the outlook for cruise is not as positive. Cruise passenger arrivals over the period of January to December of, 2000 of last year were 1.2 million, which equates to 30% less or 560,000 fewer passengers compared to the record-breaking year of 2019. The cruise industry is continuing to evolve, moving towards larger and larger ships every year. To stay relevant as a cruise destination and protect the market that we do have, which contributes to over $200 million in our economy, we must adapt and be willing to rethink the possibilities. One burning question that we must address is the friction between, that happens sometimes between stayover and cruise guests. Now, while stayover tourism brings greater economic benefit, we must also recognize that the opportunities that cruise tourism provides for many Caymanian businesses and entrepreneurs. This is one of the reasons why it is important to maintain a balanced approach to support both stayover and cruise tourism, ensuring ongoing inclusion and success of Caymanian enterprises on both sides of the industry. At the same time, we must also pay attention to providing the optimum resident and visitor experience. If we cast our minds back to those pre-pandemic years, the industry was booming from economic prosperity. And from that perspective, things were well. But there were also some social impacts affecting our quality of life, as well as our environment. Traffic, congestion, and delays became prescient issues, and the strains on our infrastructure and the environment began to surface. There were complaints about major attractions being oversubscribed, and there were no, no places on our beaches to go. And sadly, that's creeping up on us again now. It had reached a point where people would actively avoid going to Georgetown, particularly on cruise ship days. And for those who couldn't, for example, a lawyer going to the courthouse, they had no way to avoid it. Now, returning to 2019 numbers will benefit from an economic perspective, but requires permanent solutions to fix the traffic and congestion issues and better pedestrianize and manage the improved visitor experience and minimize the impacts that residents are having to deal with on a daily basis. Now, you see, the problem in 2019 wasn't that we had too many visitors. The problem was 
we didn't manage them correctly. What we needed to do more, effective, more effectively was to find solutions to manage pedestrian, vehicle, and cruise passenger flows. And I'm happy to say that work is ongoing to address all of these issues right now. For example, by working in collaboration with industry partners such as Disney Cruise, solutions are being identified to improve the ways in which movement of cruise passengers is managed at our cruise port. We are also in the process of determining whether it is sustainable for our cargo port to remain downtown in the heart of our business district. Now operationally, the port is nearing the end of its lifespan and is struggling to cope with the ever-increasing volume of imports, which is being driven by organic population growth. If, cargo, if the cargo port was moved to another location, the space available to manage our cruise operations would virtually double overnight. This would help with the management of the embarkation and disembarkation process and the flow of passengers traveling to and from our tour buses could be organized more efficiently. There would be significantly less pedestrian spillover onto our harbor front. Passengers taking tours could be picked up within the larger footprint of the cruise port, thereby reducing the congestions on our streets, which was one of the most common complaints by, res by residents in our recent reports. Another benefit of moving the port is that it would allow us to manage imports into our country more efficiently. Port operations would not be confined to only working at nights as they are now. They could also work during the day, essentially doubling the amount of time available to clear imported goods. KPMG, along with a company called Stantec, are in the process of developing an outline business case, which will examine the options, whether the cargo port remains where it is or moves to a new location. And I look forward to receiving that report with recommendations on the preferred option by the end of the second quarter of this year, so I can take to the Honorable Premier and my cabinet colleagues. Clearing the congestion of our roads and removing the bottleneck is not only beneficial for residents, it, is also, it also improves the tourism experience for visitors, and it is a prerequisite for the tourism sector's continued success as well as growth if and when necessary. I'm sure many of you would be aware that the airport connector road is now open, and by all accounts, it is already alleviating the weekend pressure points, thanks to the hard work of the Honorable Minister J. E. Banks. <laughs> Plans are in place for the extension of the Godfrey Nixon Way to the harbor front, which will allow road users to bypass town and get to their destinations faster and hopefully in a better mood. Diversity of our tourism product and introducing more tours, activities, and attractions dispersed across our islands will also depend on a well-connected road system. This is another reason why you've seen me and others in this administration lobby heavily for the extension of the east-west arterial. Think of it this way. If we were to pack 1,000 people in this room, it would feel chaotic, and overcrowded. But if we were to spread those thousand people across this amazing property, the experience would be far more comfortable, enjoyable, and, and stress-free for everyone, like the Kimpton Seafire experience always is. That was a plug for the hotel. <laughs> the same principle applies to the East-West Arterial in terms of its benefits it will provide in our efforts to diversify our tourism product. Businesses could be more easily and effectively set up outside of town, and it would, be, it would also support the de decentralization of government services, retail, and housing, all with the added benefit of alleviating traffic, which contributes to a better quality of life. 
Having the road in place with activities spread across the island would give visitors more choices of things to do. And one of the reasons why products like Stingray City and others are oversubscribed is due to the lack of alternative options. And speaking about alternative options, this is one of the reasons why this administration gave me the support in purchasing more beachfront property under the guidance of the Honorable Premier who is in charge of lands. And I want to take this opportunity, Madam Premier, to thank you for your continued pressures and, and support to buy beachfront property because this will help us in this endeavor. By buying more beachfront property, we'll have more locations for locals, visitors, and cruise passengers for them to have a place to enjoy the sun, sea, and sand without feeling overcrowded. My ministry and Department of Tourism are working hard to ensure that all Caymanians, micro and small businesses, medium-sized enterprises in particular, are meaningfully included in our tourism economy. And to this end, I'm happy to say that our government has implemented a program called the Visitor Experience Development Grant whereby a half a million dollars annually has been allocated to the 2024 and the 2025 budget to provide startup capital to Caymanian entrepreneurs and artisans to help them develop new visitor experiences across the island. The objective is to have mom and pop shops set up across the island, especially in the eastern and western districts, offering a range of things for visitors to do, which highlights the Caymanian food, crafts, tours, and attractions. You see, we believe that this will have a major effect on decreasing our oversubscription on other attractions like Stingray City and our beaches. And there is data to support this. International tourism trends are pointing to a shift in the sun, sea, and sand offerings towards more interactive experiential tourism. Tourists are increasingly seeking to go beyond the typical tourist hotspots and want to see more of the destinations that are unique and authentic. According to the American Express Travel's 2023 Global Travel Trends Report, 89% of travelers are ready to explore local hidden gems rather than the better known tourist destinations. So you can see that we're on the right track in respect to the trends by looking at unique spots with authentic adventures and small town, small town shopping across the island. I should make it clear though, that with this program, we're not looking to fund just another excursion to Stingray City or another walking, to walking tour downtown. The goal of this grant is to spur the development of new enterprises or the introduction of new tourism products within existing business operations. The qualifying criteria is in its financial, final, final stages of development, and I'll be bringing it to caucus in two weeks. And we expect to be accepting applications by the end of the first quarter of this year. I'm hopeful that this program will also help Caymanians in the sister islands because we have to be mindful that the Sister Islands also plays an integral role in achieving sustainability. And as many of you are aware, in Brack, for example, there are projects that are in the early stages of development, which I believe can offer tremendous benefits from a tourism perspective. So as you can see, there really isn't any reason to be scared of those 2019 numbers because the issues that caused a lot of the pinch points and affected the quality of life are being addressed. So we can have the same numbers, but the less negative impacts. In fact, to borrow the phrase of one of the greatest post-impressionist painters, Vincent van Gogh, and who would say, and I quote, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. And I have to say that I agree with him in that respect. To further paint the picture 
of what the future of tourism in the Cayman Islands could look like, I envision things like the development of a tourism convention center that would allow us to attract prominent conferences and events to our shores, a business, I, a business model I intend to investigate as Minister of Tourism heavily over the rest of this term. I envision seeing interconnected walking pathways and bike paths linking purpose-built accommodations with Caymanian-owned restaurants and water, sport, water sports activities. Ongoing Caymanian cultural performances would be highlighted, allowing our talented Caymanians to pursue careers within their areas of passion, enhancing our arts and preserving our cultural heritage. Visitors would have the opportunity to experience so many aspects of our culture and cuisine in an authentic way. It is important to note that since all industries in the Caymans are interconnected, a well-designed and vibrant tourism sector would lead to a more efficient transportation system that can be used by all of us, reducing the number of vehicles on our roads and improving our overall quality of life. Moreover, we can create sustainable future for tourism in the Cayman Islands that not only benefits our economy, but is also supported by a strong educational training opportunities of our people. As such, through the Hospitality Training Institute at UCCI and our Ministry of Tourism Scholarship Program, or through the DART organization, Hospitality Education Training. Ladies and gentlemen, I started my presentation by outlining my vision for tourism and I've provided a brief overview of some of the actions and initiatives that will transform that vision into a reality. Actions like controlling congestion and improving the experience for visitors and residents, and initiatives like diversifying our tourism product and decentralizing the industry to provide more opportunities for all. But sustainability in tourism isn't about preparing for the present as well isn't about only preparing for the present, but also the future. It is about maintaining the assets and the attributes that are in place in the Cayman Islands among the most special locations in the world. It's about having a well-planned industry with residents, visitors, and businesses, and employees coexist in harmony. It's about a government and industry partners working together aligning our efforts and sharing our resources to build a more cohesive and resilient industry that is inclusive of all stakeholders involved. It's about continued investment in our infrastructure, like what we're doing on our roads, at our airports, and our seaport, underpinned by the thought of opportunity, opportunity and growth. It's about focusing on keeping crime low, like you heard from Her Excellency today, to maintain our standing as a safe jurisdiction and continuing to provide the police with the support that they need to do their job. It's about keeping and sharing our spirit of kim and kindness, which people love so much and reflects the warm wealth and friendliness of our people. And it's about keeping our islands clean because no one wants to visit a country that is dirty and filthy of derelict vehicles everywhere you go. The Beautification Task Force, which was established under my ministry and being led by our Honorable Parliamentary Secretary, Ms. Heather Bodden, is doing tremendous work in keeping our islands clean. And I'm very pleased with their cleanups and media campaigns. And the feedback from the public has been immensely positive. I would like to ask you all, as business owners, and corporations to assist in these efforts by keeping your business places clean and well manicured. Trust me, it makes a difference and attracts more guests into your stores. Finally, sustainability is a means of expressing our commitment to continuing embracing the forward thinking strategies that ultimately will deliver multiple pathways of opportunity and prosperity for all people 
who call the Cayman Islands home, but primarily for Caymanians, because at the end of the day, irrespective of whether we look at sustainability from economics, from social, human, or environmental perspective, it is our people who are at the heart of this country and the core of sustainability. And please allow me to take the opportunity to highlight the fact of what the Honorable Premier said earlier. Whether by pain or by plain, we're in this together. Therefore, I look forward to a future of tourism in the Cayman Islands that empowers all people, especially Caymanians, that embraces inclusion and supports the protection of our natural and cultural assets for future generations to benefit from and enjoy. As a prominent business leader, Jokic Zeiks, it's a German name, I had to get accustomed to pronouncing that. <laughs> the president and CEO of Harley Davidson expressed, and I quote, sustainability is no longer about doing less harm, it's about doing more good. And I believe that working together, we can achieve all of these aspirations and really do more good to create a thriving and sustainable industry that benefits our economy, it benefits our people, and it benefits our beloved three Cayman Islands. I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to taking your questions.